nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. So today we're going to build off what we did in the first session where we introduced you to some Python techniques and now we're going to take those techniques and we're going to access a lot of these database repositories, figure out what kind of data is out there and how can we access it and leverage that for our own purposes. So again, we, we want to motivate why we want to learn more about this, this field of data science and machine learning. And, and we know that these techniques have already taken off in fields like commerce, finance, big data, Google and Facebook use these every day. And they're used for a lot of different things from predictive models to get certain types of properties. You can use them for classification or dimensionality reduction. And even more exciting is that we can use these in sort of an iterative loop for design of experiments where these models based on our data can tell us what the next experiment should be or the next route that we should explore. But at the end of the day, all these things rely on one key thing, and that's the data that we have. And oftentimes that data isn't in a location that's centralized or easy to access. And so that's where this idea of cyber infrastructure comes in. NanoHub is, is one of the ones pushing and developing tools and models for researchers around the world to use. But there are a number of other repositories like the Materials Project, Citrine Informatics, OpenKim, that allow people to access their data through quick and easy to use APIs. Many of them are based on simple Python scripting. So that's going to be the focus of today, is we're going to figure out what data is out there, how can we access it the easiest, and how can we leverage that data in cool ways with visualization that we can build into some of these predictive models, which we'll get into in some of the following sessions. So for today's talk, we're going to go over kind of what an API is, what these database repositories are, how you can access each of these databases through simple to a little bit more advanced querying, and then for those of you that are a little bit more material science focused, uh, I would like to offer you an opportunity to stay a little bit after the Q&A for a third piece of our session, where we're gonna do something very specific to the field in querying phase diagrams and material properties. So even if you aren't a material scientist and, and you want a little bit of extra credit, I'll be sticking around for a little bit after the session to, to keep that going. So to start, uh, I hope that most of you have already gone to this uh, tool to go through some of the initial steps. Uh, but just to clarify, we'll be working on NanoHub today at this querying data repositories tool. So I'm going to launch it myself. And the first piece after you go to the landing page uh, should hopefully already be completed. So that would be the instructions for how to get your unique API keys uh, for these tools. So while that's loading, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint and go through just a couple of those slides that hopefully were sent out in the instructions beforehand. So once we get to the landing page, uh, you'll make your way through a set of four different notebooks. And your only homework before this workshop was to go through the first one, which kind of summarizes what an API is and how to get certain API keys for the Materials Project, uh, Citri Nation, and Wolfram Alpha. I would like to iterate that these API keys should be kept private. Uh, they are linked to your personal accounts, and generally in the terms of use, they ask that they are not to be freely distributed, and your account access may be revoked uh, by the client if, if those terms are not met. Okay, so for the first activity, we're going to navigate to that second notebook, and we're going to kind of give you an introduction to querying. So again, what an API is at the end of the day is some sort of handshake protocol that allows you to access a database through some type of a software. And an API stands for an application programming interface. And so what we're going to do is use simple programs or Python scripts to access data on Wolfram Alpha, which I'm sure some of you have used in your math classes to solve differential equations. But they have a querying system that is simpler to a Google syntax for a, a, a simple string query. And then we'll move on to a little bit more of a robust database uh, from a company called Citrine Informatics, where they're slowly curating a, an ever-expanding database of not only their data on different types of properties, uh, but you can also publish your own data on this database to deliver it to the community at large. And I'll, I'll show you a couple links on how to do that as well. So let's get back to the tool. So the first thing that we're going to do is go down to this second link here for an introduction to querying. All right, so just like we learned in the previous uh, workshop, or if you weren't here, to run these Jupyter Notebook cells, the command would be shift enter to go through them. So the first step we, we need to do is we need to load our unique Wolfram Alpha API key. So press shift enter to run that cell, and you should get a little box here that allows you to access your key. So you'll input your key, whatever it may be, into this box, and then you'll hit enter when your time is ready. 
I'm going to move my screen off for a little bit because I don't want to share my API key with you. And after you enter your API key and you hit enter, you should get a small success message. Awesome. Let's do the same thing for the Citri Nation API key. Great. Two successes. All right, let's move on. So now the first thing that we have to do in any type of Python scripting is importing libraries. So the main libraries we're going to import are the Citrin Nation client and this class, Citrine Data Retrieval, which we'll insert our API key into that will allow us to do that handshake protocol with their database. And we'll do the same thing with Wolfram Alpha. We're going to use a couple of miscellaneous tools to plot and visualize some data, as well as do a little bit of data massaging. And here is where we're actually going to create some variables that are our API keys that you entered up here. So shift enter to run that cell. All right, so let's do our first query. So at its base level, Wolfram Alpha allows you to do very, very simple queries where you just ask it what the answer is, very similar to the solution to a differential equation. So what we're going to do is we're going to create this class client from Wolfram Alpha, and here is where you're inserting your API key. What we're going to do is we're going to say, I want to know the melting temperature of a couple different oxide materials. So what we can do is we can create this temporary list that we'll append values to as we go through a loop. And then we're going to create a list of maybe some oxides that we're interested in. So alumina and chromia are very commonly used oxides that form in industri industrial applications. And maybe we're interested in some radioactive oxide, or hafnia is also another one that people might be interested in. These, these can be tailored to any type of query that you want to do. But what we're going to do is we're going to create a loop where we iterate through each oxide in this list here with this simple command where this client that we've created, we're just going to query. It's one line to do these queries for these, these simple oxides. And we're going to ask the oxide plus the melting point. And we're going to print out the result there. Now, the resulting value that you're going to get from this query are going to be string values. So if we want to do something with data, we usually enjoy working with floating points. So we're going to convert this string into a floating point number. We're going to get rid of some of the junk on the end of it, this units. And then we're going to store in this temp list the values that we collected from this simple query. So now let's look at the data. We're going to use a simple Python plotting program called matplotlib, sorry, a simple library. It's sort of the MATLAB ported version of plotting in Python. And we're going to create this simple bar graph where we've taken the oxide compounds that we've queried, the temperatures that we've appended into this list. We'll enumerate through the list to give us some labels, you know, just to make our plot look a little bit nice, change the axes labels, grid size, and here you have it, a really simple plot from a very simple query where we can see that one of these obviously has a much higher melting point than the others. And the others, though, have very high melting points. So these are things that you would not be able to melt in your oven at home. OK, so let's move on to a little bit more of an advanced query. This is a very kind of just introductory. You can use this for whatever you want. Again, all these Jupyter notebooks can be downloaded at your leisure, and the code can be modified to tailor your personal use. All right, so maybe a little bit more applicable to some of you, the band gap. The band gap is a material property that a lot of people, not just materials people, are very interested in. So we're going to query a band gap database from Citrine Nation. So again, shift enter to run the cells. And we're going to do something very similar to what we did in the Wolfram Alpha step, where we're going to use this Citrine data retrieval class with our API key in tow. And then instead of saying query, we're going to say get data frame. So it's just the syntax that's associated with this specific API, but the, the, the commands are relatively the same, where we're going to create some data frame from this query, and the criteria that we want is we want to query a specific data set ID. So I've listed one here by default for the band gaps, so we can shift enter to run this cell, and the query will begin. So this query is happening on the fly from Citrine Nation's database, and then we'll display the head of that data frame. So here we have a couple different material compounds and their respective band gaps. So let's do a little bit more of an advanced plotting exercise. So we've stored this in a pandas data frame. And as we went over in the previous workshop, pandas data frames are an extremely powerful tool in Python that essentially gives you the vis visualization capabilities of an Excel spreadsheet, but the filtering and the massaging capability of something a lot more advanced than lists or dictionaries. So we can now create another plot Instead of using matplotlib, we're going to use plotly. And the advantage to marrying pandas and plotly is that instead of saying, well, I want to plot the first and third column of something, 
I can simply say, well, I want to create this bar chart, and I'm going to use the data frame data, and I'm just going to call these column headers. Now, that's a lot more intuitive to me, saying I want to plot the chemical formula and the band gap, and then show the plot that we're going to make. The other advantage to Plotly is after you have your data, you can create labels on any of these points that are going to show up in the plot below. So we have this huge list of different materials and their band gaps, but at any time you can hover your mouse over and you can see what the band gap of that material is. Now you'll notice that some of these bars have multiple blocks on them, and that would be different experimental values for the band gap depending on the method. The advantage to querying things from the citrination database is they usually include a DOI reference for your uh, compound, so that if you're wondering why the number is the way it is, you can always refer back to the literature. Now, I mentioned before that these databases are free to distribute among the people. You can access the database however you'd like, but you can also submit your own data. So I'm going to click on this second link here. And this is going to take you to the Citrine Nation landing page, where you can actually upload and add your own data sets to their server. So this is quite advantageous so that your data no longer just sticks on your hard drive until one of your groupmates asks for it, or you graduate and your advisor asks, you know, hey, I want you to keep this around. You can now publish it here and anybody can access it and use it for their purposes, or you can share the data freely. The more data, the better our machine learning models and our predictive capabilities are going to be. Now, I've only listed a couple examples here, but let's say we wanted to query something else like the melting point of all the elements in the periodic table. All we'd have to do is change this number here, run the cell again, and now we're going to perform a separate query for the melting points. And now if we want to change the plot, all we have to do is change this key here to something like the melting temperature. Awesome. So now we're going to plot the melting temperature of all the respective elements in the periodic table. Again, you'll notice a couple of these blocks on here have multiple points, and that's just for the, the uh, duplicates and the experimental values. But you can see that some of your heavier elements like tantalum, tungsten, rhenium, carbon, obviously, they're the ones that have the highest melting points on the periodic table. Now I've listed a couple examples here, but the databases that are available, you can go over to this data sets at the top of the web page, and you can search for something like, say, mobility. And there are going to be a number of databases with their unique IDs that are available to you that you can query from and use their data. Or maybe you're interested in the hardness of a material. And there are a couple of databases there that you can use. OK, so let's move on to the second activity in the talk. So we've motivated why we want to do data science and machine learning. And now I want to motivate you for why we're going to do this activity in particular. So I'm going to preface this with it's going to be a little bit of a chunky piece of code. Uh, but I'm going to walk you through it step by step, but it's important to have a motivation for it. So imagine you're at a company or uh, some type of consulting firm, and your client or boss wants you to develop some kind of an oxide scale for a certain process or material. I'm not sure what that might be. We're, we're working in hypotheticals right now. Now, oxygen is all around us. We know that it bonds extremely well to lots of different materials, so we know that there's a crazy number of oxides out there that we could work with. But we're going to narrow it down and create some figures of merit for what we want to work with. So perhaps we want to mitigate the diffusion into our, our material that we have this oxide scale forming on. So we want a relatively close-packed ionic structure. We want to figure out what the ionic packing fraction is of our material. And maybe we want something that has a relatively high stiffness when compared to things like alumina or chromia. So there are a number of ways that we can do this. You know, we could just search through the literature and hope that we find something, or we can kind of do the, the data science way where we can do some shotgun queries to figure out what's out there. And then we can filter the problem down a little bit. So we can say, well, I only want to say consider completely stable phases, and I want to remove anything that's metastable. Maybe metastability is a criteria that you're interested in. Diamond, after all, is a metastable structure, but it's an incredibly hard carbon structure. Graphite would be the ground state structure of carbon, but we know that diamond exists around us and can last a long time. Now we can again filter where maybe there are oxides where stiffness data isn't available. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create a couple different filters after we do this large query to then figure out what we have and then do some cool data visualization to figure out what's the next step moving forward. 
So we're going to do this on the materials project database. So the materials project database is a density functional theory database where you can calculate ground state energies of crystal structures and materials. We don't need to get too much into the physics of how that works because that's not the focus of this uh, workshop. However, they do have an amazing API and an ever-growing database that we can access and gain some really rich information from. So let's go back to our notebook and we're going to access this querying and managing data from materials project module. Okay. So first things first, shift enter to run through the cells just like before. And then we're going to load in our unique materials project API key. So again, I'm going to move my screen over so that I don't share that with you. After you have your key in there, press enter. I almost didn't press enter and you all would have seen my key. All right, so now that we have our key entered, we've had that success message, we're going to import the necessary libraries uh, for, our, for our goal. So we're going to import PyMatGen is the module that is used for the materials project. And we're going to import a lot of querying and plotting capabilities that come with that package. And then again, some miscellaneous tools uh, like pandas, and then importing our API key here, where similar to before where we created a class with Citrine Nation or Wolfram Alpha, we use this MP rester class with our API key in tow. All right, so the first thing that we want to do is we want to access the materials project database and I want to ask it for every single oxide that's out there. So like before, we're going to take this class that we've created, MP rester, and we're going to do this simple query command where I want to ask for all the elements that contain oxygen and the properties that I want to get from it are the unique ID that's associated with that crystal structure, chemical formula, volume, density, number of elements, this E above hole is that meta stability or stability criteria that we're going to use to filter our data a little bit. And here is where they store their mechanical property data. So these would be things like bulk modulus, shear modulus, and certain ratios that tell you how a material deforms under stress. So we're going to shift enter to go ahead and run that cell. And as soon as you start running the cell, you should see a little loading bar that has a number that's approximately 60,000 entries. So, like we said before, there are a huge number of oxides that exist out here, and there are only 60,000 that exist on this database. This begins to scratch the surface of what could be, but they're still creating and making more, uh, more crystal structures on this database. So after this query is done, I'm going to go through these cells kind of one by one, walk you through what they're doing. Uh, but what's, what's being returned to us is essentially a dictionary for each set of elements, or e each set of structures. And Dictionaries are great for accessing key and value pairs, but we're going to see pretty quickly with 60,000 entries, it becomes a lot more advantageous to use something like pandas data frames. So we're going to take everything that's in our dictionary, we're going to expand it out a little bit, do some of our own kind of filtering, and then figure out where to kind of go from there. All right, so the query is finished. Now we're going to go through and say, okay, well, I want to access just one of these entries in my giant query database now. So I have this BI203 compound where this output that I have is the dictionary that I mentioned with these key and value pairs for the task ID, formula, volume, density. And then interestingly, this energy above the convex hole, again, we don't need to get into the physics about it, it just means a stability criteria. Meaning if this value was zero, this would be the most stable structure that exists out there based on thermodynamics. Now we can see that this number is not zero, so this would be a metastable structure, but maybe that's something you want to consider in the future. For now, we don't. And we also notice that this material doesn't have any elastic constants calculated for it. People are actively trying to populate the database with more calculations, but now we see that at least for this compound, with this structure, we don't have it. So we can use that as a filtering process as well. So we're going to kind of do two steps in one. I'm going to go through some of the cells. Uh, I'm going to go through this first cell line by line to show you what it's doing in the calculation. If you start to fall behind, again, these lectures are recorded, and you can refer to your handout that you have. Uh, but then I'm going to skip a few steps to kind of do the two filtering steps at once to, to get to the, the main punchline. 
So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to create this energy cutoff value. I basically want to take this database of 60,000 queries and say if there's anything that is even remotely metastable, so one milli electron volt away from the ground state energy, I just want to get rid of it. I don't really want to consider those right now. So shift enter to run that cell to save that variable. And then we're going to go through some calculations. So here what we're going to do is we're going to say I want to get rid of anything that doesn't have that ground state energy value. And now I want to calculate that ionic packing fraction that we did before. So how close those ions are together and we want to mitigate that diffusion process. So we're going to create some empty lists for some dummy calculations. And then we're going to create a modified dictionary that will eventually append values to if they meet that energy criteria. All right, so let's begin the loop. In the loop, we're going to say that if this energy above the convex hole, we're going to access some point in our data set. So we're going to iterate through all those 60,000 points. And for the key and value pairs, I want the value of this key, this energy stability criteria. We're going to convert it into milli electron volts, and some of these numbers are a little bit small. And if it's above that energy criteria that we put up here, we're just going to skip it. And we're going to go to the next step in the process. So now that we've skipped it, we're going to start adding values to our, our list. We're going to get each of those keys and each of those value pairs from the dictionary, and we're eventually going to move them into a modified dictionary of our own. So these are the unique IDs, the formulas, the elasticity. So we're going through for each of these pieces and getting the value that corresponds to that key. Sound good? Now for each of these atoms, we have a number of atoms that exist in there, so we can get the formula, the number of elements, and the types that exist. Now as we move through, we again wanted to say, well, we want to calculate the ionic packing fraction. So to do that, we need the total amount of volume that these atoms, can, uh, these atoms take up. So we're going to do a simple query that we showed you in the last workshop, where using PyMatGen, for individual elements, you can create this class and you can query something like the average ionic radii. We showed you in the last workshop that you can do things like the Young's modulus or thermal conductivity, and the syntax for this command is no different. So now that we have that average ionic radii, we're going to append it to this dummy list that we created above, convert everything into volumes, and now that we have the volumes of each of the atoms, we can sum up those atoms together to calculate total volumes in this block here. And now that we have the total volume of the space that's contained, we can take the total volume of our crystal structure, and we now have this calculated ionic packing fraction. Now again, this was for a compound that was below the energy criteria that we made. So this operation isn't being done for anything that would be above this one milli electron volt uh, category. So now that we have that, we're going to create a new dictionary that we, that we stored above with the key being the materials project unique ID. And then in that, we're going to create a list of the values of the composition, the tensor, packing fraction, and those properties that we're interested in for the next operations. OK, so shift enter to run that cell. It's going to take a little bit of time since we're iterating through 60,000 different dictionaries. But once we have that, I want to kind of push now everything into a data frame. So for that dictionary that we just created, we're going to push everything into a data frame. Okay. Now the way that we can do that is we can create lists from our dictionary. We can append all of these values to lists, create a NumPy array from those lists. So we have lists that we're basically stacking together. And now from that NumPy array, we can create a data frame that we'll call DF Oxide. And in that data frame, we'll have these unique columns, as I showed you before in the Citrine Nation query. Where instead of saying, you know, I want to plot this column at this index, we can actually say, I want to access the formula column or the density column. That's a really powerful tool of pandas. Okay, so now we're, we're going to skip through a couple steps really quickly because we're just going to get to filtering out for the mechanical properties. So one thing that you'll notice pretty quickly is that a lot of these crystal structures on the database do not have that elastic tensor value that we're looking for. They just haven't been calculated for that structure. Now again, your boss or your client said, well, I want to know what the stiffness of these materials are. So if the, materi if the data isn't there yet, let's get rid of it. So for any of these values that have none, there are going to be some values stowed away in here that have NANs as well. We're going to scrap those from our data frame as well. 
So that's what we're going to do here. So in this block, we're basically saying for anything that has this value of none or not a number, we're just going to delete it from the data frame. Now, again, if you'd like to go through these lines a little bit slower, I encourage you to follow along in your handouts and rewatch the lectures to really digest and chew on this material. So now that we've done that filtering process, we have a dramatic reduction in the dimensionality of our problem. We've gone from 60,000 queries of every oxide that exists on this database, and now we've filtered it down to something that has only 855 compounds in our curated pandas data frame. All right, but something you might be noticing is that this set in here, since we have these curly brackets, is still a dictionary. Now, I want to access each of these values that are in this dictionary, but again, I want to do it in a pandas sort of way. So real quick, we're going to go through a small loop to take all those values that we're looking for, get the value pair, key value pairs that we want. So something like the bulk and shear modulus, this Poisson ratio might be an interesting property that your boss or client is interested in. We're going to push all that to these dummy lists that we're creating here. Do the same thing where we create an, an, a NumPy array of all these lists, push it to a data frame, and then we're going to concatenate the two data frames together here where now we have our original data frame and all those mechanical property data that we push to something else and merge the two together. All right, so that looks a little bit more like it. We have unique materials IDs, we have these chemical formulas, and now we have the ionic packing fraction, density, and all the values that we're looking for for these mechanical properties. So let's do a little bit of visualization now. So yesterday, or in, in Previously in this week, Juan Carlos walked you through Plotly and how to make some more advanced images with these Jupyter Notebooks, some interactive plots. So we're going to build on that knowledge. So like any Plotly image, we need to import the libraries first. We're going to customize the layout of what we want our image to look like. So in there, we can change the titles of the X and Y axes. We can change the font family. Maybe you're a big fan of Georgia or Calibri. I enjoy Times New Roman. And you can also change the height and width of these graphs to be whatever you want. Personally, when it's in the kind of widescreen uh, display, I like to have something that's not a perfect square. It's a little bit easier for me to visualize. Now again, one of the things that I said is the advantage of using Pandas data frames is that you can quickly access pieces of your data without having to iterate through the entire data frame. You can give simple logic commands to plot your data or access pieces of data. So in this first piece, we're going to plot all of our data of just the density. So instead of saying I want to plot the certain indexed column, I can just say data frame dot density, and that will pull all the values from that column. Similarly, I can do the same thing for the ionic packing fraction, and I can change the marker size. I'm going to make them all black just to make things a little bit easy because I want to compare it to what's out there industrially, you know, some well-known oxides to see what we can win out of this project. And then again, the advantage with doing something with Plotly is now we can take this formula column that has all of our labels for each of the crystal structures. And any time I hover over this graph now, I can see what compound I'm actually looking like, looking at. So with 855 element or database, with 855 pieces in our data set, it's a lot easier to visually kind of hover over and see what it is you're looking at. Now again, I wanted to compare these to some more well-known oxides to see how different this, you know, the, the state of the art is out there. So again, instead of searching through my entire data frame for Illumina and getting the values and plugging them in, I can do a quick pandas logic operation where I can create my own dependencies and say, okay, in this data frame, I want you to search for the formula that corresponds to that oxide that I'm interested in. And I want you to make sure that it's the lowest energy state. It's the ground state structure of that material. And then I'm going to use this dot locate function, which basically says in all the columns for these logics, locate the value that is the density. And then I'll do the same thing for the Y component, where I say, in this data frame, find me the formula and the ground state stable structure. Find me the ionic packing fraction. And then I can change the colors of all these points to stand out. And this is what our plot's going to look like. So we can see that we have kind of three distinct regions where we have the ionic packing fraction versus the density. And these blue and green symbols that are showing up are our alumina and chromia. 
So they're very well-known industrial oxides, and part of the reason being is they bond well to surfaces. There are a number of characteristics that make them ideal, but what we're looking at right here is, well, they're kind of a middle of the park when it comes to the ionic packing fraction, but there are a number of compounds up here where they have a high density and a high ionic packing fraction that maybe you want to consider for your application. But now again, let's do something a little bit more advanced. You know, we don't just want to look at the ionic packing fraction and density. We're interested in the mechanical properties. So we're going to create a little bit more of an advanced plot where we look at the shear and bulk modulus of our material. And rather than coloring everything black, what we're going to do is say, well, I can use my data frame and I can use another material property as my coloring scheme. So you can imagine now we have a 2D plot but we're adding a third dimension to our data just by using the color bar. And we can do this very quickly in Pandas and Plotly where we just say, okay, in this marker, I wanna change the size, change the color, and then we can add a little color bar to the side of it, you know, just to make things look a little bit prettier. So for those of you that aren't material scientists, it should be relatively easy to see that there's a linear correlation between the bulk modulus and the shear modulus. And there's some correlation here that we find with the Poisson ratio. So for those of you that are interested in tying together how properties are correlated and how we can use those to predict outputs, that will be the focus of some of the following lectures with Saketh, where we learn more about machine learning and building descriptors for these problems. But now again, we were kind of interested in the bulk modulus and maybe the ionic packing fraction as sort of our two quantities of interest. So we can access those really, really quickly. So let's change the title here in the ionic packing fraction, just so I don't get confused. Change the title up here. And then all we're gonna do is we're gonna change this x-axis value to the IPF. We don't have to do anything more. We can shift enter to run the cell. And now we have something that looks kind of interesting. So recall that we wanted something that has a relatively high stiffness. So maybe we wanna only consider points that are above 100 GPA. And we have a, you know, a figure of merit with this ionic packing fraction where maybe we want to improve on the alumina and the chromia values, so we will only want to consider something that's 0.3 or higher. And now we're left with this space of elements that we can sort of scroll through. So we have some titanium oxygen bonds. We have some very complex oxides that we could consider. We have some radioactive ones. And maybe that's a filter that you want to add on to this, that you don't want to consider anything that has uranium, plutonium, thorium. And that's another additional filter you can add to continue paring down your problem. But at the end of the day, you can use something like Pandas data frames to quickly do that and massage your data to something that's a little bit more applicable to you. Okay. So that's going to that's going to conclude the second piece of the uh, activities. In the interest of time, uh, we're not going to do the third activity uh, it, during this workshop. I would encourage you, if you on your own time you want to go through this third activity, it's a very useful for those of you that are interested in phase diagrams. And for those of you that do want to stick around after the Q and A, I will go through this notebook and walk you through it. If you want to stay, I'll, I'll be here after the uh, after the workshop closes at, at noon. Uh, so with that, I'd like to reiterate that these cyber infrastructure tools uh, give you access to these databases. So maybe you're not totally interested in the melting points or the band gaps of materials, but at the end of the day, what I hope you've gotten out of this session is that these APIs give you immense power to do quick bouts of querying, and from there you can filter it down to solve the problem that you're looking for. And these platforms are not limited to Citrine, Materials Project, or Wolfram Alpha. There are a number of other databases out there like OQMD, Aflow, and each of them have their own API process, but many of them are similar in the way they work. It generally involves some API key, some class that you're gonna create with it, and then a simple query command that's gonna depend on the syntax of those that programmed it. So with that, I'll turn over the floor to you, the listeners, uh, for a Q&A session. Question. Yeah, so you just that. mentioned that there will be a, a recorded video about this. Where could we find the video afterward? The, the links to the videos will be posted in the same uh, website of the uh, workshop. Thank you. So 
So, Zach, I was wondering if you can walk us through the process, the steps required to upload data sets in uh, Citrination. Nation. Uh, I think that's something that's very valuable and, um, and, and to highlight that a, a lot of these are experimental databases, right? This is not something that is for computational uh, engineers and scientists, it is for all of us. Yeah, so on the Citri Nation database, the process for uploading your own data has actually been streamlined to a very large degree. So if you navigate to their website, you can go to these top uh, buttons that are at the top of their, their menu selection, and you can go to this Add Data module. And here is where you create a new data set. So this could be calculated IPF, for instance. And this could be calculated values from the Materials Project database. And now, at any time during these queries, any time you have a pandas data frame, the process for saving something to a CSV is actually very simple. Uh, I can't remember the exact syntax off the top of my head, but it's something like PD dot save to CSV. Don't quote me on that. The syntax is there, I just can't remember it off the top of my head. But anytime you have these, uh, these data frames, because they have all these headers and very well-defined rows and indices, you can save any of this to a CSV file. And then when you get over here to Citrine Nation, here is where you would upload that database that you have. After uploading, a member of the team at Citrine Nation would contact you and they would basically say, okay, based on your data, we want to maybe you know, shift where the columns are or rename some things for accessibility. Uh, but then they would work with you on a case-by-case -case basis to, uh, to work with that. I've just been told that the syntax is PD dot to CSV. So at any time we can put in our pandas data frame and then we can name it something test.csv. Now, if you were operating this in your home directory, this CSV would get saved on your NanoHub home directory. Or if you're running these Jupyter notebooks on your local machine, wherever that uh, data frame would get saved to, you can upload that then to the Citri Nation database. So there's a question in the comments here. Does, does Citri Nation validate the correctness of the uploaded data? Yeah, so when, when they go through processing the data, they generally will try and do some sort of cross-checking to make sure that the data that's being put on there uh, has some type of citation associated with it. But I think maybe Juan Carlos, if you're in here, you might be able to speak a little bit more to what types of data they allow to publish. I'm sure if you just give them something that's absolutely erroneous, that would get flagged so that you can generally trust the data that's out there. Uh, but as for you know evaluating correctness, sometimes in these models we actually want the bad data. So maybe the data itself was curated correctly, but it's data that isn't necessarily helpful. And that actually seems like it's a bad thing, but that non-helpful data, the things that are our mistakes or the things that didn't work, actually help build our models to be a lot uh, more strong. So as for the, the validation piece of the Citri Nation side of things, I can't totally speak for the process that they go through, but I do know they do a fairly thorough checking process. Excuse me, I have a question about the data. When, for example, we want to get some data from this data bank, and one, I mean, some experimental data, we want to get some information about what configuration or what, uh, like, what type of, uh, like, configuration they have used they did the experiment is it is there any way that we can get those those information too yes so that that's going to depend a lot on the individual database that you're looking at so for something like the band gap uh, for those of you that are the experimentalists in the room um, there are a number of different ways to calculate the band gap so if you were to go to the Citri nation database and look at the band gaps they're going to tell you I guess maybe I should go to this piece here. Anytime you pull these databases, they're going to have a citation associated with it. So if you think that the number might not be quite correct, or you want to investigate that number further, they would have this piece that would point you to the literature where they source that value from. 
And then you could access that paper, read through it, and say, oh, they calculated it with this absorption method or this other type of spectroscopy method, maybe. And then you, you might be able to build off that or go you know, validate it in your own lab setting. So the short answer is some of them are available, but it is going to depend on the database itself. And thank you. And uh, I'm I'm assuming that any, anything that it, that you upload to this data bank is going to be publicly, I mean that shared. So you you're not able to uh, like share it to some specific group, right? You actually can uh, restrict the 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 flow of the data if that's a uh, something that you want to do. So I, I believe I was actually looking for something the other day uh, for hardness properties, and I believe that it was actually kept private. Not sure if it was this database exactly, but there are options to keep it private so that not everybody can access your data. But but the data that is publicly available, you can use for research as you see fit. Uh, so you you are allowed to publish with the data, to use it in your own publications, to use it in your own research. And of course, what's encouraged, and I think it's very important to incentivize folks from uh, contributing this data is that you have to give proper attribution and uh, discuss and, and cite the original source, right? So if you cite data from Citrination, it's not enough to say I got it from Citrination because then the original author of the data uh, can get credit. I think it's important for all of us to uh, understand where the data comes from and to the degree possible uh, cite the original uh, cr creator of the data. Uh, clarification on one of the earlier questions. Uh, you can, there are data sets that have metadata included in them. Uh, uh, the chat has one link to such a data set that has metadata on processing temperatures, so it is possible to add that um, so in case you're interested. That's an option. So if there aren't any additional questions, I'm going to take that as, for those of you that are still here, uh, if you'd like to, I'm going to move on to the third activity. Before we do that, let me let's all thank uh, Zach for a, a really nice uh, lecture. If if you can unmute yourselves and uh, we can properly thank Zach. Awesome. Well, to those of you that that, that came today, uh, thank you a lot. I'm I'm really hoping that. You're able to get something out of this, and uh, we hope to see you in, in future workshops for the upcoming weeks. Uh, we, this is only the second workshop in our six-part series, so we have a lot more information that we hope we can give to you over the next week. Okay, so to expedite things, I'm going to move on to the third piece then. For those of you that are still in here, congratulations, you get extra credit. Uh, and that extra credit is the ability to, again, use the Materials Project database uh, this time, actually, we're going to just figure out, you know, what sort of uh, phase diagrams have been calculated for different types of elements. So this one might be uh, is absolutely more tailored to the material scientists in the room. Uh, but if you're interested in learning more about material science, I think this is kind of a fun place to start. So essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to basically do a simple query of a couple different combinations of elements. So if we say we have four elements that we're interested in. We know that each of those can form different uh, binary sets of two, ternary sets of three, or even quaternary, where there are you know, four elements that have all bonded together in some crystallographic structure. And we can actually really easily access those combinations and then create simple phase diagrams or stability plots out, out of those uh, data sets. So we're going to navigate back to the uh, Jupyter Notebook landing page, and we're going to access this uh, last and final Jupyter Notebook. Okay, 
So like always, shift enter to run through the cells. We're going to load the materials project API key. And now what we're going to do is, since the materials project is a DFT database, uh, that means that all these calculations are done at zero Kelvin. So this would not give you information about the phases that are present at elevated temperatures, uh, but it does give you a good starting point to figure out, well, what structures can possibly form at that ground state structure? And so what we're going to do is we'll run through these cells at any point in time, uh, if, if you want to enter into the chat a phase diagram that you want to create from a certain set of elements, we can do that on the fly. And we'll create phase diagrams that are going to look something like this, where you have your three corners here of lithium, sulfur, and tin. And we can do this for any combination. All right, so just like before, we're going to import our libraries, get the API key defined. And now we're going to create this list of queryable elements that we want to. So... The example that I'm going to do is this cobalt silver antimony oxygen system. This was chosen semi at random uh, because on the materials project database, you can do some uh, filtering through their online GUI interface to figure out what four element compounds are out there. This is one of them. So I chose it as this example so that we can actually extract a compound that exhibits both binary, ternary, and quaternary phases based on the combination of elements. So at any time, we can change what these elements are in this list. And essentially what we're going to do is we're going to figure out, okay, what kind of combinations of these elements can we make? So based on a list of four, we can say, what are the number of combinations if we pair two of them together? And then we can create a list of those combinations. How many combinations are there if we put three of them together or four? Now, if we put all four of them together, there's only one combination, so that's, that's a pretty easy place to start. After we have these lists, we're going to basically combine all of them into the actual sort of chemical formula that, that you'd be able to look at. So these would be the sample outputs of what we're looking at. So the number of binary combinations from a four-element list would be six, four for a ternary, and again, one for the quaternary system. Now again, these combinations of elements are going to look like something like this. So we could maybe combine cobalt and silver, or cobalt and antimony. Cobalt and oxygen, we would assume, form some kind of an oxide. And these would be some examples of the binary or ternary compounds that we form. Okay, so what we're going to do, and we can actually do this in one cell, is we're going to take all of those combinations of elements that we've created. So for every piece in that list that we created, we're going to grab the entries, and we're going to do this entries in the chemical synthesis command. Now, this is unique to the materials project and their, uh, their syntax. And we can use this phase diagram class to essentially create diagrams based on if it's a binary, ternary, or quaternary phase. And it will automatically detect that. And then we're going to do a quick plotting exercise here, and then we can show the full data. Now, the data that's saved, there's the crystallographic structure, there's the energy stability, and what we can do to sort of figure out, okay, well, how many binaries actually formed is we can go through those lists and say, for every entry ID, if it's above a certain length in the string, that's going to mean it's a binary. It's just one of the ways to classify it. And then we can also characterize if it's above that energy above the convex hole again. So I want to extract the stable structures that form in this binary. And we're going to save those to a dictionary so that we can access those in the future because maybe we discovered something we want to investigate further. So these first things that are being plotted are sort of formation energy diagrams. Uh, if you want to look at everything as it's uploading, you can click this part of the cell here to expand it. So in this diagram, we see that the formation energy of cobalt and silver remains at zero, meaning that these two elements at least based on what's on the database currently, are not going to form a compound. But as we scroll down, we see that there are a couple of different phases of cobalt and antimony that form. So there are two binaries that we can extract out of this system. Now this is going to automatically generate all those binary combinations that we were looking at. So we have cobalt oxide. Now we see that antimony silver doesn't form a compound, but silver oxide forms a compound. You'll notice that some of these points have a little red circle and this blue text that gets hovered over it. Those are st structures that are deemed to be metastable, but it's not super 
unstable. So we can change this criteria here to get rid of those points if you want. But for now, this is the default setting in this notebook and also in the documentation for this API. So we can go through and we can scroll through the system and see, okay, well, there are some binaries that form. And now from those binaries, I can extract all of the ones that were stable phases. So in that dictionary that we started to create above, scroll up a little bit, we created this dictionary of saved values that both are a stable structure, so we characterize that here, and based on the length of the string, we know that it's a binary compound. And these are the stored compounds that we have from that structure. So we're saving the space group, we're saving the formula, and we're also saving uh, what the materials project ID is. So these IDs are saved here. Now, once you have this dictionary, any of these IDs can be used to sort of do a secondary query, where maybe you're interested in the crystallographic structure and the band gap. So for this last structure here, this MP230, for running this cell and saving this new dictionary, I can then go back to that simple query where we've created this query class above, and now I can say, well, instead of querying for all of the oxygens like we did in the previous exercise, I can simply say, okay, just for this materials project ID, I want to know the formula, the band gap, and the final structure of the material. Because maybe I want to take that structure and do some calculations of my own, or maybe put it into an XRD simulator or, or whatever. The documentation for what properties you can get out of here is available on the materials project, and I believe I included a link to it in the uh, workshop slides. So feel free to explore those options and what kind of information you can get out of these compounds and, and for what you might want to use it for. Okay, so we're going to do the exact same thing that we did for the binaries, except now we're going to do it for the, we're going to loop through these combination three elements that we had. So now as before, we remember that silver and antimony didn't make a stable binary phase, but antimony and cobalt did. So that's why they have a couple of points on this line. So we're kind of repeating a little bit of what we did in the previous block. But now we can see that for something like silver, cobalt, oxygen, we actually do form something in the middle of this triangle, meaning that we have a stable ternary phase. Now this is going to go through for the other two combinations that we had created, and it'll create the same ternary phase diagrams for each of them. After we do that, we can go through the exact same process that we did above where we can take those dictionaries of stable values and the values that actually form ternaries. As you can see, the cobalt oxygen antimony system is a little bit messier than the ones above. And after that, we can figure out, based on the stored compounds that we, that we created, we can do the same query, now for something we know is a st stable ternary, and get maybe the crystallographic structure or space groups or whatever property you want out of it. After this is done, we'll do the exact same thing now for the quaternary phase diagram. And you'll notice very, very quickly that it's a giant mess and the, because it becomes this pyramid structure with a lot of lines coming together. Uh, so it's a little bit hard to read, but we do find that there is one stable quaternary phase. And then we can pull up the crystal graphic structure for that. So that's almost done running. So at any point in time, uh, this is an easy way that we can do this through some quick Python scripting to access the database, plot these diagrams. But at any point, if you are interested in you know looking at things from a more uh, you know a more interactive point of view, the same way that we went through and created those combinations of say, okay, I want to look at cobalt and oxygen, I can search for compounds that contain those elements, which would be all of these. You'll notice that a lot of them are stable. So these would be those formation energy that are negative values that we showed in the binary phases. So if we go back up there, we recall that we found COO2, COO, and CO304. Over here, we have those compounds that we found on that phase diagram. So instead of going to the materials project, clicking through everything, we were able to do it kind of on the fly. So let's look at this crystal structure. Anytime you go to each of these uh, unique pages, this is the materials project ID that we were querying. 
they usually show you some crystallographic structure, which is what we were essentially extracting here for a different compound. And then a number of them are going to have different properties. So they have calculated XRD properties. Uh, in this example, they do not have the elastic tensor calculated for the material, but they do have something like piezoelectricity or dielectric constants. So each of these materials are going to have different calculations that are done for them, but they are always accepting updated calculations. Uh, if, if you're interested in performing VASP on your supercomputers to get some of these uh, database is sort of more up-to-date and more curated. There are tools available for you to do that. And if you are interested in something like that, I don't work with the materials project directly. They have their own separate team, but I can forward you in their direction if that is something that interests you. Okay, so now that we've finished running this, uh, we can look at the Quaternary Dictionary, plot it, and then we can get one of the structures uh, similar to the binary ternary uh, examples that we did. So again, this looks like a little bit of a mess, but we do see that here there's this cobalt silver antimony oxygen system that does form somewhere within the pyramid, not on any of the faces or the edges. And then we can, again, extract that data, do a simple query, and figure out you know, what we're working with at that point. So that's kind of the conclusion of the workshop in whole uh, with the first pieces on simple querying, a little bit more advanced querying, and then something very, very specific to the materials field uh, that I, I felt was better served for those of you that wanted to stick around a little bit longer. So if you have any questions about this piece, or you thought of some questions uh, from the previous lectures or the previous Jupyter Notebooks, I, I'd be happy to address those now. Hi, Zach. Uh, this is a Wayne Chen. Uh, I'm the Associate Dean in, of the Research and Innovation in the College of Engineering. Hello. Uh, I do not ask any specific questions, but I just want to thank you for your effort to put this together. Well, thank you. Uh, pe yeah, people all come fine now, but this is very, this is excellent to make people stay intellectually uh, active. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that feedback. Uh, maybe I can ask a quick question. So if I wanted to query data from the materials project and I wanted like a starter code, I would imagine I would come back to this tool and look at the Jupyter Notebooks. Would you recommend me starting from the previous notebook or from this one, which seems more? I, I would say that if you want to kind of get your feet wet with very, very simple queries with the materials project, I think this is a pretty good place to start. Um, the reason that we left it for the end is because it is very specific to the field of materials. Uh, but yeah, if, if there's any sort of compound that you're interested in, this piece here would be the easiest thing to change. And then you can just sort of click through the cells and you can see that there are the very simple queries at the end of the day. Maybe you go over to the materials project and you find a material ID that you're interested in. And you can do this simple query command here. So it's one line, and you can get any of the information that you want out of it. So I would think that if you're kind of you know, thinking, I want to use the materials project more in my research, and I want to you know, build off what's done in the workshops, I think this is a pretty good place to start. And the second uh, Jupyter notebook that I showed you all is more of a tutorial on data massaging and management rather than getting maybe specific material properties. Okay, thank you. Okay, there's a question in the chat. Um, is there any restriction on how much data you can pull from the materials project database? To my knowledge, there is not. Um, whatever is available on their website, you are able to access. Uh, as you were able to see in, in the previous notebook, I can do a crazy large query from their database and they don't yell at me. It is worth noting though, that that is because those are the restrictions or the lack of that they've made for their API. Uh, if you use something like the Wolfram Alpha API, they have both uh, free and commercial licenses. So I can't remember the exact number right now, but I think the Wolfram Alpha API, the free version, limits you to approximately one or 2,000 queries a month, which we, automat we already would have gone extremely over that if we would have done the query for every single oxide uh, that we pulled from the materials project database instead of that small list of four that we did. So with Citrine Nation, you're free to pull whatever data sets you need to because it's all publicly there. 
I believe Materials Project also views it the same way. Uh, but then again, yeah, uh, the Wolfram Alpha side of things, uh, there is going to be sort of a limit on the number of queries that you can perform. Any other questions for Zach? Well, if not, then it's a little bit over noon and thank you for your time. And we look forward to seeing you in some of the other sessions. And we hope you enjoyed this session.